as a genetic counselor who's worked in an IVF clinic and at a PGT laboratory, I think it's really important that anyone who's thinking about PGTA knows exactly what some of the limitations are of the testing, what the accuracy of the testing is. So today I'm going to present four misconceptions about pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Hi everyone, it's me, Katie Lee, CGC, and welcome back to my channel. Today, what I want to do is start a big series on pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, or PGTA. So if you are somebody who is planning on utilizing IVF, in vitro fertilization. That is the procedure where eggs are retrieved out of one person's body and they're fertilized with sperm in the lab, in the IVF lab, and then a embryo is transferred back into a patient's uterus to attempt to conceive a pregnancy. So if you're thinking about IVF, one of the most popular add-ons to an IVF cycle these days is PGTA, or just genetic testing on the embryos for chromosome errors. And this test has a lot of different names that it goes by depending on the clinic that you're working with. So you may hear it referred to as any of these following things. PGS, pre-implantation genetic screening, that's the same as chromosome testing on embryos. That's the same as the most updated term, which is PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Let's break the title of that test down into pieces. Pre-implantation, we are having the embryo tested before it's implanted back into a uterus. Genetic testing, it's a type of genetic test for aneuploidy. Aneuploidy is simply the scientific term for an abnormal number of chromosomes. As humans, most of us have 46 chromosomes. That's what's typical or euploid. Aneuploidy would be any deviation from those 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. So PGTA is an incredibly common test. It's usually offered by most IVF doctors or reproductive endocrinologists, REs, for many patients who are planning to undergo an IVF cycle. And the whole goal of PGTA is to find the chromosomally normal or euploid embryos that are going to have a better chance for implantation, a reduced risk for miscarriage. Now the benefits of PGTA are much more clear as we get older, because for us females, our egg cells have been in our body for as long as we've been alive, actually longer than that, since we were in our own mom's womb, and they're aging with us. So the older we are, the higher our risk to have embryos with chromosome errors, or the more of our embryos are likely to have chromosome errors. And if you transfer an embryo that is chromosomally abnormal, that could oftentimes lead to miscarriage or cause the embryo to fail to implant into the uterus, but it could also lead to a baby affected with a chromosome syndrome, like Down syndrome, for example. That's just one of a few examples. As a genetic counselor who's worked in an IVF clinic and at a PGT laboratory, I think it's really important that anyone who's thinking about PGTA knows exactly what some of the limitations are of the testing, what the accuracy of the testing is. So today I'm going to present four misconceptions about pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Misconception one, it's 100% accurate. That is not the case. Truly, no genetic test is 100% accurate, and if someone's telling you it is, you should be suspicious. All genetic testing has limitations. There are limitations in methodology and also limitations in the fact that if a human is performing any part of a test, there is always a little bit of room for error. Most laboratories that offer PGTA would quote an accuracy of maybe around 98% for picking up large chromosome imbalances. So it is a really nice screening tool but it's just that, it's a screening tool. There is a chance that you could have a misdiagnosis on PGTA and an embryo that's called normal or euploid could actually be abnormal or aneuploid and vice versa. An embryo that's called aneuploid on PGTA could actually be normal. So while PGTA is very good, it is not a 100% accurate test. Misconception two, it looks for everything. A lot of people want to hope that PGTA can eliminate the risk for any type of genetic disease, for autism, for cancer, for conditions that run in their family like multiple sclerosis, and that is simply not the case. What you should remember from ninth grade biology is that in those 46 chromosomes, there are hundreds and hundreds of genes, thousands of genes, in fact. 
And each chromosome is really just a container that holds hundreds of those genes. Those genes are the individual instruction manuals for how a protein in your body is formed. So there are different types of genetic disorders. Chromosome imbalances, like Down syndrome, that's caused by an extra copy of chromosome 21, that is what PGTA is attempting to detect. But single gene diseases, diseases like um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, caused by BRCA1 or BRCA2, or diseases that are complex and oftentimes we don't understand the cause, like autism, are things that PGTA absolutely cannot assess for. And then beyond that, every time any of us tries to conceive or does conceive, we all have about a three to 6% chance to have a baby born with a birth defect. It could be something more mild and treatable like a club foot or a cleft lip, or it could be something severe. It could be something like a heart defect that requires multi multiple surgical operations. And PGTA cannot reduce the risk for those single gene diseases, for complex multifactorial disorders like autism, and it cannot reduce the risk for birth defects since most birth defects are not genetic and they're not due to chromosome imbalances. So PGTA is in no way an all-inclusive screen. I know as a parent that it would be amazing if we could all test all of our children to make sure that they're going to be perfectly healthy for their whole life, but there is no such screen available and there's not going to be for a long, long time because it is just much more complicated than what we understand right now. Misconception three, I'm gonna keep this one short. Misconception three is that all PGTA labs are the same. No, this isn't the case. Each laboratory will have different protocols. They may use different methods. They may report things in a different style. So sometimes when I'm working for iGenomics, the PGTA lab that I consult for, I will get a patient who asks me questions about PGTA that was performed by a different laboratory. Each lab is going to have its own reporting style. And while I know iGenomics's style and how they report in great detail, I cannot speak to other labs results reports. And there may be different nuances in their reports. So if you have questions about a results report that you have for PGTA, you want to contact the lab who performed that testing to speak with their genetic counselors so you can get specific answers to your questions. Okay, and the last one, you guys, misconception four. PGTA is a result on the whole embryo. It's not actually the case. It's a result on an embryo sample or a biopsy taken from each embryo. So just to give you a quick overview of how PGTA works, once an embryo is created in a lab, so an embryo is you know, a fertilized egg, an egg that's been fertilized by a sperm cell and grown out usually for five or six days to make blastocyst stage, a small biopsy is taken, usually three to 10 cells are removed from this blastocyst embryo. That's about 100 to 150 cells. And that biopsy is sent off to a lab like iGenomics. The embryo itself will typically be frozen and it will remain at the clinic. So the labs actually aren't testing the whole embryo. If you tested a whole embryo, you would destroy it in the process. So that's why that tiny sample or biopsy is removed and sent off to the lab. So the results report that we release or that any laboratory releases is a result on that biopsy. And in the vast majority of cases, we assume that the biopsy result is exactly the same as that remaining frozen embryo. But it is always possible that the biopsy result could differ from the embryo. So you could have an embryo that's mosaic or that has two or more cell lines, maybe some cells that are perfectly normal, with 46 chromosomes and some cells that are abnormal, and the biopsy may have only included one of those cell lines, and the rest of the embryo could be different. So that is a limitation of PGTA. There is just no way to date to test every single cell of the embryo without destroying it. So we rely on that small biopsy and assume that that sample is representative of the rest of the embryo. That's it for me, guys. I'm planning to release quite a few weeks of content on PGTA because I know there are so many questions about PGTA these days. So whatever questions you have, please drop them below and I'll be scrolling through and looking for good video topics. Thanks for watching.